Hello friends, my name is Dr. Sunil Bhatt and I'm the Director and Clinical Lead of uh, Pediatric Hematology, Oncology and Bone Mineral Transplant at the Majumdar Shah Medical Center, Naran Health City, Bangalore. Now I, I told you um, uh, some time ago that uh, we'll be starting a series of videos uh, for the general public as well as for the caregivers and the parents of the patients with thalassemia major. In first video, I discussed with you what is thalassemia, how does it um, you know, manifest and what are the causes of thalassemia uh, major. Now that was covered in the first video. Now in this uh, today's discussion, the today's video, what we want to cover is, um, is how to effectively manage thalassemia. How do we look after the patients who are diagnosed with thalassemia major? So as we know, thalassemia major is a problem where body or the bone marrow doesn't make enough blood or enough red cells and hence they're dependent on blood transfer to be given from outside. You need blood from outside because you're not making enough blood. So there are two principles of management or in fact three principles of management of thalassemia major. One is to how to give them effective blood transfusion. Second is that what are the complications which come up with blood transfusion? That's called iron overload. I'll discuss about that in a little while. But second is to how to look after iron overload because of the transfusions. And the third is effective follow-up. That means how do we follow up? How do we how do we monitor these patients, especially when they become older, you know, more than five, eight, 10, 15 years of age? How do we monitor them? In today's video, I'll be discussing only the two first two parameters. That means how to do effective blood transfusion, how to do iron chelation or iron overload. The third aspect we'll do in a separate video that is how to monitor, how to follow up. Now coming to the first point that is blood transfusion. The first question which comes in our mind is that is blood transfusion, is it required or can we just skip the blood transfusion? Answer to that is no, we cannot skip blood transfusion in thalassemia majors and because they don't making, they're not making their own blood, we need to give the blood from outside. So there's no shortcut in that. Second question which comes in the mind always is that what is the level of blood or the hemoglobin we should maintain? Now we have to remember that in thalassemia major, because it's a slow process, children even with hemoglobin 5, 6, 7 will be otherwise active and normal. They look like normal from outside, but inside the low levels of hemoglobin will create its problems. What problems it will create? It'll, it will let their organs to grow. The liver becomes big, the spleen becomes big, they will have facial changes, they will, they, you know, they, they will have bony changes and some of them are irreversible. So hence, friends, the most important message I want to convey here is that please maintain the hemoglobin of these thalassemia major kids before giving blood 9.5 to 10.5 gram per deciliter. Please maintain levels 9.5 to 10.5 before giving blood. So this level has to be maintained before giving blood, not after giving blood. After giving blood, this will become 13, 14. We're not interested in that. We're just interested in what level to maintain before giving blood. That, that is 9.5 to 10.5. So that's first important question which is asked. Second question which you ask always that, what type of blood to be given and how much to be given? So blood, as I said earlier in the first video, has got many components, plasma, white cells, platelets, and red cells. This child has got only problems in the red cells. So we do not want to give him anything else except for red cells. So hence, we should give this thalassemic kid only packed cell transfusion. We do not need to give them whole blood. We need to give a uh, packed cell transfusion has got only, only white uh, red cells in it and do not, does not have plasma, does not have white cells and does not have platelets. The third important thing is that how much blood to give. We need to give them 15 to 20 ml per kg of pack cell. That means at one point of time, you can give them 15 to 20 ml per kg of pack cell. That means if the, if the kid is 10 kgs, we can give 150 to 200 ml of pack cells. If a kid is 20 kgs, we can give 300 to 400 ml of pack cells. So the amount of blood which is given doesn't depend on the units or doesn't depend on anything else. It just depends on the weight of the patient and based on that, you can give blood 15 to 20 ml per kg. The third question you ask for the blood transfusion is that over how long we should give this blood transfusion. Whatever blood is required to be given to the patient, to the thal thalassemic kid, 15 to 20 ml per kg 
has to be finished in four hours. We should not get the blood packet from the blood bank and hang it on the bedside for more than four hours because it gets spoiled when it's kept on the room temperature. So all the blood which is being to be required to be given for the particular kid for the thalassemia major has to finish in four hours. For example, in a 10 kg child, you are giving 150 ml of Paxils. This has to finish in four hours. In a 20 kg child, you are giving 300 ml of Paxils. This has to finish in four hours. So whatever blood is required has to finish in four hours. That, that, that's the third thing. Now the fourth thing is that, is there any other things in the blood we need to take care of? Yes, we need to take care of two important things. One is that, as I said, it has to be Paxil. And we need to remove the white cells in the blood which are there to be given to the patient. We don't require to give white cells to the kid because the white cells in the blood which is collected from someone else will go in the kid's body and do something called as sensitization and it also lead to more reactions in the in the in the in the kid's body, thalassemic kid's body. So we need to remove these white cells before giving blood and that removal is called as leukodepletion and this leukodepletion is done by filters which can be done either at the blood bank level, that means the blood bank does this leukodepletion or you can do the leukodepletion at the bedside when you connect a filter with the blood and that filtered blood goes to the patient. And the last thing about blood is that this blood can transmit with them infections. What infections? HIV, hepatitis B, hep C, you know, other infections can come from blood, which is donated from the donor and can go to the patient. So we need to test the blood always for these infections. We test this blood by various techniques. ELISA is something which is very, very commonly prevalent and is done. But the newer method of testing the blood is NAT testing, where you can check for these infections very early on and reduce the chances of infection coming from the donor to the to the patient. So friends, in the blood transfusion, what I will learn is that we need to maintain levels of 9.5 to 10.5 before giving blood. We need to give Paxils. We need to give leukodepleted blood or leukodepleted Paxils. We need to, you know, finish this blood in four hours, whatever is to be supposed to give to the, to the kid. And last is that we need to give 15 to 20 ml per kg of pack cells and and the amount of blood which is to be given will depend on the weight of the uh, weight of the kid who requires a blood transfusion so that was the first component and that is about the blood transfusion now the second component of our discussion as i said today is iron chelation that means how to reduce the iron levels in the body now i told you that blood transfusion for the thalassemia major kids is a lifeline we need to give them the blood transfusion from outside because they are not making their own blood. But the blood, you know, regular blood transfusion, every few weeks when the blood is given, it brings with them some problems. And what are those problems? One problem is, as I said, infections, and we address that, how to minimize that. The second problem, which is a severe problem in thalassemia, and that is iron overload. Iron overload means the, the blood which you are giving to them has got iron in it and it does it, it it keeps on accumulating in the patient's body and the levels of iron in the patient's body becomes very very high when the blood iron levels in the body becomes high this iron gets deposited in the various organs what organs heart liver hormone glands like thyroid like pancreas like adrenal gland like pituitary in the brain all these organs develop a lot of iron overload and that leads to problems. It leads to heart failure, it leads to you know, liver problems, it leads to hormone problems. And hence, we need to remove this extra iron which is coming from the blood from the patient's body. Now, how do we do that? It has to be done by medications called chelation. So the question is that, when should we start chelation? When we should start giving medicines for reducing the iron from the blood? We check a parameter called ferritin. Ferritin is a test, blood test, which measures um, the level of iron overload in our body and we check this ferritin when the patient has received almost 9 to 10 blood transfusions we check the ferritin level and see what the ferritin level is if the ferritin level is more than 1000 then we will go for um, start of chelation in the baby so that's first when to start when the ferritin has crossed 1000 that usually happens after 9 to 10 transfusions number two is that what is the dose of iron chelation there are three medicines which are used for iron chelation, calfer, you know, defrocerox and desferol. Desferol is injectable, the other two are oral. 
Defres Rox is the first line or the, or the most commonly used iron chelation. Your doctor can explain you which one to use. But what is important is to give the correct dosing. And as the children grow, the dose of iron chelation will also along with based on the ferritin and based on the patient's weight, will have to increase the dose of the medication as we go along. So there is no defined dose for iron chelation. It depends on the patient's weight. So that is the second important thing. The third important thing is that can we stop the iron chelation? No, we cannot stop the iron chelation. Iron chelation is lifelong because your blood transfer is lifelong. As we keep on giving blood transfusions, iron overload will keep on happening and we need to keep on removing the iron from the patient's body. And hence, we cannot stop iron chelation. Yes, as I said earlier on, we can increase or decrease the dose based on patient's weight and based on ferritin levels or iron overload levels. If the, if the iron is levels are coming down, if the ferritin is coming down, we can reduce or increase the dose. Now, what is the magic number or what do we need to do with the, with the iron overload? We need to maintain our ferritin as close to 1000 as possible. We should not let it go high and that is why it's always try to keep at, at the level of 1000. Now, there are modern ways where iron overload can be measured more appropriately and more effectively than ferritin. What are these modalities? It's called as T2 star MRI. So the, the kids who are more than eight years of age should have a T2 star MRI, you know, at one to two years interval to understand what actually their iron overload in the body is. And that may also help us to understand whether they need any modification of the medications to reduce their iron overload. That's what that is second. The third very important point is about ferritin. When we check the ferritin for iron overload, what are the precautions to be taken? One very important precaution is that ferritin in, in medical language, we call it the acute phase reactant. That means any small infection, fever, cough, cold, vomiting, loose motions can increase the ferritin levels. So if a thalassemic kid requires a ferritin estimation, a ferritin blood test, we should not do it if they are having any of these infections because it will be fallaciously high. It will be just high, but it's not actually high. It's high because of infection. So we should avoid doing ferritin estimations when the patient is unwell or the baby is unwell. We wait for at least for two weeks for the infection to settle down. That's number one. Number two is that ferritin is there's a lot of interlab variation. One lab will do some value, second lab will some other value will come. So it's very important to keep monitoring whatever reasonable good lab you have, you keep on following with the same lab for a period of time. And the third important thing is there is no importance of one ferritin value. What's important is the trend. So you, you, when you keep on checking the ferritins every three to four months from the same lab, you'll see the trend of ferritin and that trend would be very, very important and that will help your doctor to take decisions on how much and what to do with the iron chelation medicine whether it increase whether they have to decrease and they will take necessary precautions on that so friends i'll close this discussion today in this current video what we have discussed today in this current video was that how to give effective and safe blood transfusion to thalassemic kids and also how to give effective chelation or iron reducing medicines to these kids and how what are the precautions to be taken especially when we are uh, you know, looking after the iron overload in these babies. So with that, I'll close this discussion today and I'll be coming with a, another interesting um, aspect of thalassemia major in the, in, in the, in the next video and, uh, and we'll discuss a different aspect of thalassemia major in that video. So thank you very much for your attention.